thanks for coming. Um, my name is Sean Whitcomb, and my pronouns are he and him. Uh, I'm a, a, an instructor at Mesa Community College. I teach environmental biology. This is loosely uh, connected to my job, I guess, in a way. Um, but uh, first, I want to talk about you know what's what's the importance of mi mi of micro mapping. First of all, if you're not familiar with the term micro mapping, it is um, basically the idea is that you are mi mapping things in very fine detail. So yesterday I spent my breaks going around campus and mapping benches, um, things like benches, picnic tables, you know the the finest little details on the map. Uh, why would we want to micro map parks, uh, you know, urban parks? Well, first of all, parks are very important. They're important for the health and well-being of the residents of the city. Uh, they're important for ecological reasons. Uh, you know, they provide habitat for species. They, um, the trees and parks sequester carbon. All kinds of other things I could go on and on about. Um, but for me, the first thing that got me interested in micromapping parks is they look really cool. I mean, when you're scrolling around on the map and there's a sea of beige and gray, and you come across all these shades of green and different shapes, it just looks really nice. And I think it's something that can get people interested in maps and, and in mapping. Um, and it's kind of the first passion that I found. I've only been an active mapper for about a year, and um, the first thing that really ignited my passion was micro-mapping. And it's not for everyone, but um, you know, it's something that I really enjoy doing, and I think it's a great way to get other maybe new people into uh, mapping. And another important thing is that you can learn a lot about OpenStreetMap and the city that you live in or wherever you're doing the micromapping. I learned so many new techniques from doing this micromapping micro, micro project. And um, I learned a lot about my city. There's 183 city parks in Phoenix. I would have had no idea that, that's, that there's that many. And I've never visited most of them. And I'm, now I have a, a, you know, an interest in actually visiting most of these parks and learning more about them. Um, and also the data can be very, very useful. Sometimes people will ask, well, what's the point of micromapping? No one's ever going to use the data. We don't know what people will use data for. So why not collect the data if you're interested in collecting the data and maybe someone will find a use for it. And I have a good story about this. My partner and I wanted to have a picnic for her birthday back in February. She wanted to have it outside at a park in a place with shade and ramadas um, that had picnic tables, that was near a pond that we like to visit, that was not too far from a bathroom, but not too close to a bathroom. There is literally nowhere else where you can find all of that information about a specific park except OpenStreetMap. Um, and you know, for, for parents who want to take their kids to a shaded playground, very, very important in Phoenix in the summertime. No other map is going to show which ones have shade and which ones don't. Um, you know, where are the picnic tables and grills? Uh, what's the tree cover in a park? That could be useful, useful ecological data uh, that we can actually get some new, good information about for a city. So um, this was my specific project that I did. Uh, there are 183 city parks, like I mentioned, and it took me uh, about from April to September of last year to complete this. You can see all of them on the map there. Quite a few of them, a lot of them are little tiny parks. Um, and I had a lot of free time in the summertime. That's why I was able to do this since I'm a teacher. Um, so just a kind of a, an overview of my workflow, if anybody is interested in doing this. Basically, I went to the um, Phoenix Parks uh, uh, you know, Parks and Rec website and copied information from all of the listed parks onto a spreadsheet. And then um, they have an open data portal for the city of Phoenix, and I downloaded park boundaries to um, be able to input those and, and, and trace them. Um, but I found out a little ways into my project that it's not a proper open license. Um, that does, it's, at least it's not compatible with OSM. And that was an important lesson that I learned. So I did, I, I did get a few you know, boundary uh, outlines from the city and um, you know, wasn't able to use the rest of them once I found out. But you know, it's, it was uh, an important lesson, again, that I, that I learned. And I know not to do that and, and ask for permission if it's not properly open uh, in the future. So I started my project in the ID editor. But it was a little bit cumbersome to do a lot of the stuff that I wanted to do. I was, I was intimidated about using the Jossum editor, but um, I realized I just need to jump into it and learn. And this was a really good way to learn a lot of the things, the techniques that are in Jossum um, that make it so much faster and easier. And I'll talk about a couple of those. I did a little bit of like on the ground, on the spot mapping with the um, Go Map mobile app and if you're not familiar with that it's a pretty useful app it's especially useful for adding nodes maybe not so much for you know large ways and such but um, really great for just adding a few benches here and there picnic tables 
Most of this was armchair mapping, which means I was doing it at home on a computer using aerial imagery, and I relied uh, especially on Bing imagery and uh, some Bing street level imagery, but there's not a lot that gets into the park if it's street level imagery. It's mostly just for the, for the parking lot and such. So, um, you know, one nice thing about doing this in Phoenix is that armchair mapping in Phoenix is very easy for good and bad reasons. I mean, it's because we don't have a lot of trees, unfortunately, so this is kind of the maximum tree cover that you might see in a Phoenix park, um, which some of you from other areas might, uh, might be surprised by this, but this patch of trees in the upper right, that's, that's pretty much like the most tree cover you're gonna see in a park, and it's gonna be a very small patch. So you can see here, uh, picnic tables are very vis visible. I learned to uh, identify the shapes of like barbecue grills next to the picnic tables and things like that. A lot of stuff that you can actually pick up from the aerial imagery that maybe wouldn't be easy to see um, in, in other areas. So just kind of made it easy for the area I was doing it. So what did I actually do for this project? Basically, I would get to a map and, uh, you know, most of them were already on there. It's not that I added 183 map parts to the map. M many of them were on there. I only added about maybe six total. I, did, I wasn't counting in the very beginning how many I had added, so that's just my estimate. Um, and usually the first thing I would do is unglue the park boundary from the roads. This is something that I learned um, you know, pretty early on. People suggested that I do because if you have a boundary that is glued to a road and if you adjust the, the road a little bit, it adjusts the boundary of the park and that's not what happens in the real world. I mean, the, the park is here, the road is here, they're separate things, so they shouldn't be connected and it makes it a little easier uh, if people are going along later and having to change roads and such to not have things glued to the road that shouldn't be glued to the road. So you can see kind of the difference there between a glued boundary and an unglued boundary. And then um, there were three important tags that I added to every single map and that is the operator so that you know that it, this is a city of Phoenix Park. This isn't just some you know private park or an area that's been mislabeled as a park. For example, yesterday I was doing a little mapping on campus and there were some areas that I would consider more like a garden because it's like a little planted area with a little sign that says such and such garden and someone had tagged it as a park and I just don't think that qualifies as the definition of a park. So there are areas like that that I wouldn't want to be included. So I made sure the operator tag is on there uh, and on opening hours. That's really important, you know, if you want to know when the, when the park is open and then the address obviously so people know where it is. So here are just, I'm just gonna go through a list of some of the things that I added to each of these parks. So things like sidewalks and footpaths, very important. Picnic tapes, picnic shelters, tables, benches, grills, uh, playgrounds, um, and then the shade structures on the playgrounds. Most parks in Phoenix have shade structures covering part of the playground. Again, really important in a, in a city like Phoenix. And then there are all, all kinds of buildings that might be there, like recreational centers, senior centers, uh, the restrooms, other buildings. And then I did a little bit of work with parking lots. I don't do too much with parking lots. Some people micromap every single individual parking space. Okay, I'm not that crazy, but um, you know, it's, it's, it, it is something that, that could be done. Um, and then all kinds of cool sport pitches. Obviously there's baseball, basketball, so, uh, softball, volleyball, but I also found some places that have archery. I found some places that have horseshoes and other interesting pitches that I, again, wouldn't have even known existed in the city. And then one of my favorite things to come across is exercise stations. These are those outdoor stations where you can do some sit-ups, there's a little sign that shows you how to do the move and all that stuff. I just love it when I come across those because it's nice to, for people to have a place like that to be able to exercise outdoors. Um, so, a lot more stuff. That's just the beginning of the list. I'm not going to go through everything on here, but um, you can see, you know, there's so many features that, that could be added. Um, one of the, my favorite things, actually, is dog waste bag dispensers. There was a, uh, or, or, you know, excrement bag dispensers as they're, as they're tagged. Um, there was a talk yesterday where somebody mentioned the importance of those, and I was really glad to see that maybe my work is going to good use there. I tagged a few of them on campus yesterday, too. Um, and then uh, the, the, the land use. Um, like grass and scrub. Uh, sometimes I map those if it kind of seems significant. Now you may be used to city parks where it's like all grass and maybe it doesn't seem like that important to map the grass. In Phoenix it's important to map the grass because it's not a default so there are some times when I would actually map grass or scrub if it's still kind of like natural scrub. Um, and then I sometimes map the trees. You can obviously see there's a lot of trees on here. I didn't always do it. That's pretty time consuming and, and uh, you know, I, sometimes I'll be like, ah, I'll just move on to another one if there's too many trees. But if there weren't too many, then I would spend a little bit of time working on the trees. 
One thing that made it really, really useful for me was to use uh, custom presets in Jawsome. Um, that is using the Easy Presets plugin. If you're not familiar with that, um, makes it super useful. You can see the bar along the top there. I had a ton of presets just set up that I could easily click, and it's, it saves you a couple clicks, which saves you a little bit of time. And then um, you can set up your custom presets so that you can put whatever. Uh, tags you want in that preset and it automatically adds them. So you can see here, this is the one for my recycling bins. Every park has recycling bins. I know exactly what materials are accepted in the city of Phoenix. So I can put those automatically in that preset. I click it one time and then I don't have to go through and add every single you know type of paper and all that stuff that, that you would see in a recycling bin. So here's an example of a park before and after micromapping. The one on the left was probably one of the worst examples of things just not done properly. You can see as they actually had a, a node tag and also the area tagged, uh, both of them with different spellings of the name of the park, um, glued to the road, all kinds of other issues, and the whole thing isn't actually a park. The bottom part is more of like a, 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 um, a community center. So I had to kind of figure out what's what and you know uh, uh, correct that. And um, I did add a few parks. There's just a couple of examples of parks that were not on the map already. Um, so it was exciting to just come across parks that people hadn't gotten to yet. And then one thing that I found was really cool is that the city of Phoenix has all of these mini parks located around the city. Uh, so, and they all have really interesting names, um, like Momo Park and Mong Park and um, uh, Itoto Park and Yapa Park. Um, and so these are basically just a single lot, like probably what was a vacant lot that's been converted into a little tiny park, maybe with one little, you know, half basketball court, a, a couple picnic tables, a tiny little playground. And I thought that was great, just an amazing way to get, you know, kids out there playing or whatever, a little picnic with the family right in your own neighborhood. But there's also an issue here that um, I was using supposedly an authoritative source for all of the data here. I was using the City of Phoenix website. All of the things on their, their site you would think are real, um, but I found a couple of what I call phantom parks uh, that are literally not there. They, they have uh, um, opening hours listed on the site, they have uh, the address listed on the site as if it's an actual real park, and then I went there um, because I couldn't see them on aerial and I thought, oh, maybe it's just that the, the imagery is outdated. So I rode my bike to both of these parks and they do not exist. The one on the left, is, that's from last weekend. Uh, the one on the right is from a couple weeks ago. Uh, these are not parks. Um, the other one on the right you know, kind of has the, the essence of a park, but there's no official signage or anything to tell you that it's an actual city of Phoenix park. So make sure you trust, but verify even, even an authoritative source. And I also found a park that was closed. I was randomly riding past this one on my way to another park and saw that it was all uh, dated up. Now I've reached out to the city of Phoenix about these issues and I haven't heard back from them. I've reached out a couple times so I'm not really sure what's going on with the closure and also you know are these still plans to be open in the future? I uh, don't really know for, for those other two parks. Um, just wanted to go through some of the really cool features that I came across that were maybe a little bit unexpected. I love finding water slides at pools. I mean, they just look really cool when you see them on the map, just this crazy tangle of, of uh, little shoots there. Um, and then again, those exercise stations. I just, I, I think they're great. Um, and they, they always look really neat when you come across them. You can even uh, like micro micro tag the type of exercise station it is and all of that stuff if you want to. Um, I found shuffleboard. If you've ever played shuffleboard or your grandparents play shuffleboard, um, uh, I, uh, you know, there's, I can only find one park that has that uh, and horseshoes in the same spot. Foursquare? Does anybody remember Foursquare from elementary school? Yeah. We have official Foursquare pitches at our parks in Phoenix. Um, I would have had no idea that that's there. Unfortunately, all pitches kind of look the same. It's just a little tiny square, but uh, I know that that's Foursquare at least. Um, this one, kind of a, uh, a, a really cool park that I did that's one of the crown jewels of the Phoenix Park system, huge park. Um, you can actually see the amount of detail that goes into it on the left, and then on the right is my before and after. So you can see someone had done a lot of work on this park, um, but then maybe gave up halfway. I probably wouldn't have put all those trees on the map, honestly, but since someone had already started the process, I, I finished it um, and put a lot of other details on there. That was a fun one to do. So what's next? Uh, I want to get more trees on there. I think trees are really important and they tie into some research that I'm doing for my own, you know, my, my day job. 
uh, more grass and scrub and, and, and things like that. Um, I'm trying to visit more parks and fill in the details. I want to reach out to or, or get more cities in the area of Phoenix, like Mesa and Tempe, the suburbs of, of Phoenix. And I'm really into mapping botanical gardens. Every time I travel, I was talking to Jan about this last night at, a, uh, at the social. Uh, every time I travel with my partner, we visit botanical gardens. And um, uh, I, I love to map botanical gardens. I mean, they just look amazing. And if you haven't been to the Tucson Botanical Gardens, I'm going to put in a plug for that. Really, really great garden um, and fairly well mapped on OSM, um, uh, thanks to me. Um, so if you want to uh, reach out and contact me for any reason, that's my uh, email. My, my username is MyCoda. And uh, that's, uh, I, I, I spend a lot of time on Discord if you are on the Discord. Thank you very much. And I'll open up for questions. Thank you.